A very good evening to everyone. I welcome all of you to the Asia SenseMaker session. In Asia SenseMaker, we have informal conversations, yet they maintain a level of depth and expertise comparable to a seminar setting. We are privileged to have Dr. Azra Raza today with us, who is a renowned medical researcher and executive director at Columbia University, known for her work in Militus Plastic Syndrome. She completed her medical education in Pakistan, training in internal medicine at the University of Maryland, Franklin Square Hospital, Georgetown VA Medical Center, and medical oncology at Roseville Park Cancer Institute. Dr. Raza began her research in MTS in 1984 and moved to Rush University in Chicago, Illinois in 1992. The MTS program was successfully relocated to Columbia University in 2010. Before moving, to the new, before moving to New York, she was the chief of hematology oncology and Gladys Smith Martin Professor of Oncology at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester. Dr. Raza has published her laboratory research and clinical trial in prestigious journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, Blood Cell, Cancer Cell, PNAS, Cancer, Cancer Research, and British Journal of Hematology. Hematology, Leukemia, Leukemia Research. She has mentored hundreds of medical students, residents, oncology fellows, doctoral and postdoctoral students, and serves on numerous national and international panels as a reviewer, consultant, and advisor. She is a board member of Grail Inclusive and has collaborated with pharmaceutical firms such as Novartis, Celgene, Reginor, and other on several high yielding big research initiatives. Dr. Raza has been named as one of the 100 women in Who Matters by the new Newsweek Pakistan and was part of the founder group at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, designing big breakthrough developments in science and technology with President Bill Clinton. She was part of a core group of cancer researchers who met with Vice President Joe Biden to discuss the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Dr. Raza is also the co-author of Galib, Epistemologies of Elegance, a book on the work of the famous Urdu poet. She believes that promoting and publicizing humanity's, humanity's achievements in science, art, and literature is the best way to tame the savages of man and make gentle the life to this world. We welcome you, ma'am, and we are very, very honored to have you today with us. Now, I would request Professor Amog Dev Rai to kindly proceed with the session. Thank you, Vilasha. <clears throat> Although uh, the introduction was not very long, but there is a lot that can be added. Uh, there's a lot of ground that uh, Professor Raza covers. And one of the interesting things I found out uh, that she also has a company. So congratulations on that. And I hope that the thing that we talk about in the, towards the confusion, that's a question that I'm going to have for you, ma'am. But uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for doing it, uh, for taking the time out, and for speaking to somebody who, as I just uh, accepted, I am neither an expert on cancer, and God save Urdu poetry if I were to ever become an expert on it. So thank you. With that, welcome to the Sense Maker. Uh, this is going to be a session where we learn a lot uh, from you. I'm going to be posing questions which might uh, not really reflect any level of academic debt. So I apologize in advance for doing that. But uh, the idea is that we bring a wider attention to this book, the first set, which I think is a fascinating book for more than one reason. But I think the primary one is to take cancer away from uh, the barbarism with which it is stuck or rather frozen in time. And I think you've opened it up to a larger world. So thank you first and foremost for doing that. Uh, this is being recorded. We keep the audience in this small, but once we put it up and once we put it online, uh, before we do that, we are going to reach out to you to get any edits that you might have in mind, and then we're going to put it up online. And hopefully a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Uh, some of the things that we do, people do find it uh, 
fascinating in this one, I have no doubt, would go uh, and change a lot of conversation. With that said, thank you very much for doing it and welcome to the Asia Sense Maker. Thank you, Mo. Uh, thank you, Abhilasha, for such a good uh, and lovely introduction. Um, you were very brave to go through <laughs> a long one. I am deeply honored to be here. Thank you. With your permission now, may I begin the, the process of the conversation? Please, by all means. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, go back to 19th century, and I found out about a gentleman called Dr. Rudolf Virchow, uh, who in 1848 uh, said something about politics is nothing but medicine on a grand scale. And Abhilasha just talked about the fact that uh, you and along with other people had met uh, Vice President Joe Biden, now President Joe Biden, and talked about cancer loom shot. Uh, it was a huge thing. We here uh, have analyzed some of the data that USPTO has put out from the cancer loom shot. And you keep on talking about it in your book. But the cancer research is slightly stuck in time, is it not? We are today perhaps curing 60 to 70% more people, but the people that we're not able to cure, the people who are coming in late, the, the fascinating subject canvas of your book, we still are not able to cure them. Where has this gone slightly awry? Uh, from the way you have uh, provided a lovely background connecting political intent with all sorts of uh, social activities uh, and uh, educational research activities. I love that, by the way. That true, you started by saying that uh, Virchow's quote is so beautiful. Uh, medicine is the most social of sciences. We are dealing intimately with human beings. When you ask me a question like, why aren't we doing better for people we are not curing? My question back to you is, uh, think about why are we not doing better with the people we are curing? 70% people we cure, but with what? Treatment that belongs to the caveman. Basically, we are taking a baseball bat and beating a dog up to get rid of its fleas. That's what chemotherapy and radiation therapy and surgery is doing to patients. So we are curing them, but with the same brutal things. And the 30% we don't cure, their outcome is no different. The question you're asking is why? That's a huge question about why. But I'll give you a very simple answer. Cancer is complicated. Curing cancer is going to be so difficult. Curing end-stage cancer is like curing aging. That's how difficult it is. And in the book, I say they are the two sides of the same coin. It's so complicated. So the only way we can help our patients is seeking for a cure, is to rethink our priorities. Stop being so arrogant as to think that we can go take an end-stage cancer patient and find one magic bullet to cure that patient. It's not going to happen. And it hasn't happened despite working hard for 100 years. So these are the questions I'm asking. Stop patting yourselves on the back, going around on stages of international meetings, proclaiming victory from the rooftops. You've done nothing to help patients. Where, where is the patient in all this? So in the book, I've tried to look at everything through the prism of human anguish. Right. What is it we are doing to patients with this kind of trying to develop treatment for end-stage cancer? That's my answer. After year after year, we realize it's too complicated. We thought this would be the right pathway. This would be the right gene that we could attack. We find out, no, it wasn't. It's much more complicated than that. So that's the answer. Thank you. Uh, this kind of then gets me to, and this is every time I've read the book, twice, 
once when it came out now recently to interview you. One thing keeps on popping up. Uh, the book is opens up a big volume. It kind of takes you through personal histories. You have to uh, think about people. And you're also thinking about people who have large life experiences behind them. In some cases, they don't have. They are very, very young. How do we think about cancer today? You know, 200 different forms of cancer. It's very complicated, but it's constantly evolving, not just as a disease, but also how people refer to it, how people think about it. In the, uh, you make a very interesting point in the fast paced American healthcare system, uh, the human story gets taken out. And it's a, you use a phrase, uh, was it a doorknob doctor, uh, a doorknob therapist? So how do we think about cancer today when you have multiple specialists working towards one particular solution, but the human pathos, the human story is getting lost in that? How do you deal with it as a person who thinks that medical science is the socialist of the sciences? What a lovely question. Mother of a young girl who died of leukemia was asked by her friend, how can you stand it? You know what she said, Amo? She said, first of all, I can't. First of all, I can't. But second, I don't want 12 years of her life to be defined by the leukemia she had. This is what I do on a daily basis. I am dealing with a terrible disease that shakes up not, I mean, patients are dying right, left and center, but the lives it takes away from the survivors. Think of this answer the mother gives. First of all, I can't, I can't stand it, which means every waking moment and every dream she has is informed by this tragedy and the suffering she has seen in that daughter as she underwent round after round of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, bone marrow transplant, all the things we do. So what metaphor can we use? I'm battling cancer. This is a war on cancer. This is a new weapon has arrived in the armament of cancer therapies. These are the things. I mean, what is this war? The only war is that we are telling patients you either die of cancer or you'll die of the treatment we give you. If they don't have early stage cancer, that's all we are doing. Well, somebody asked me the other day, I was in Boston just uh, two days ago. And I gave a talk and somebody asked me, Dr. Azai, you have been so critical of all the treatments for cancer. What if you got this leukemia? What would you do? And he said to me, I would simply refuse all treatments and sort of uh, opt for whatever time I have left to enjoy it and be done with it. You know what my answer was, Amok? I would take the treatment. You know why? Because it's not like if you refuse treatment, you are going to fade away into the sunset happily and live a great quality of life and die. No, then you're going to die of cancer. Then the pain and the suffering and just the anguish of it all is so horrifying. And the physical suffering of cancer is much worse in fact, than any suffering that chemotherapy or radiation therapy can visit upon us because cancer cells will invade nerve cells. And that pain is, un I come from Pakistan. I saw end stage patients as a medical student because people would, would come carrying their large tumors, sprouting out of their bodies, smelling so bad. The cancer has a very typical smell that you can really detect it from a mile away. 
But of course, we don't see end stage patients anymore. Even in Pakistan, we don't because people are more aware and they have more access to health care. But the kinds of things cancer does to you. So we really have no choice but to try and use everything we have right now to treat patients because I would do the same for myself. The questions I'm asking is how can we do better in the future? And I know I shouldn't be giving such long answers, but this will be the last long no, no, answer. Please. No, no, please, by all means. I'm just going to point out that in the last century, if you think about it, in the first half of 1900s, 1900 to 1950, we basically doubled human lifespan from something like 40 years to 80 years. Why? How did we do it? Antibiotics. Penicillin was discovered. We could treat infections and a lot of people dying of infections were saved. But the real revolution didn't come from antibiotics. It came from vaccination. Prevention of infectious disease, right? That really changed. Smallpox was eradicated, all kinds of infectious diseases. Um, in the second half of the last century, we brought down mortality from cardiac disease by 70%. That is a huge medical accomplishment. But again, we did not reduce cardiac mortality by doing cardiac transplants or treating end-stage cardiac disease. No, we did it by giving anti-cholesterol drugs. First, moving in early with coronary artery bypass, then moving early with stenting. And now for the majority, just bring down the cholesterol, change your lifestyle, have a healthier lifestyle, decrease your chances, etc. I mean, so what I'm saying is that the biggest changes in medicine have only occurred from finding the disease as early as possible and preventing it from becoming worse, right? Right. So why are we constantly investing all our resources in trying to treat end stage cancer? My colleagues tell me, well, Azra, what do you want us to do? Patients have cancer today. I, that's such a, I mean, self-defeating question to ask. Of course, we have patients today. And we, as I said, I would take the treatments available. We must give all the treatments. But let's think about tomorrow. One in two men and one in three women are going to get cancer. How can we do better for them? And that's the main premise of the book. Go from thinking about constantly the last cell to start thinking about the first cell. How is cancer beginning? How can we study it? How can we detect the earliest footprints of cancer? And how can we prevent it from becoming the end-stage monstrosity that we can't deal with without these primitive paleolithic measures that we are using. Professor, I think uh, <clears throat> what you point out, and I have a question, but I have a slightly long question, so I'm sorry for this. Uh, I trained as a health economist, so when I was doing the research for this conversation, and I still have to bring in Khaleb, uh, my chair, Jang Sahib, would not uh, excuse me if I do not. So, uh, but uh, I'm quoting a linguist, Elena Semino. Uh, and you actually did talk about it. So that's why I'm bringing this question now. I'm quoting her now. We have enough evidence to suggest that battle metaphors are sufficiently negative for enough people that they shouldn't be imposed on anyone. The study, she is referring to a study that she did on how cancer, when it is described as a war, as a metaphor, uh, kind of, it's doctors should avoid battle slash fight metaphors unless patients themselves choose to use them. And obituary should avoid them, especially the idea of losing such a battle or fight. By comparison, another common metaphor, comparing cancer to a journey, was less likely to lead to feeling of guilt or failure. In a study conducted in 2003, stated the war-related terminology to describe their breast cancer had higher rates of depression and poorer quality of life. She's a linguist based in a university in England uh, called Lancaster. And my question to you is, 
is the first cell approach not used? One, because battle often is fought at the last minute and in the trenches. And because this metaphor has become so overpowering that all our resources, our thought process to thinking about cancer to oncology is kept to this frontier mentality. And second, as a person coming in from a lyrical tradition of Pakistan, of translating Ghalib, but more than that, I've heard your lecture delivered to Aligarh Muslim University on uh, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, for example. How do you look at the role that metaphors play in clinical treatment of cancer, all 200 of them? Thank you for such thoughtful comments, uh, first of all, Amog. I'm very impressed that uh, that you're such a serious uh, and intellectually motivated individual. That's that's just great. And I'm very, I must say, I'm feeling more and more honored to be in conversation with you. Thank you. <laughs> Your honor, as I said, is entirely mine, ma'am. Um, I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has a different size. I wonder if they had it long or did it just begin. I cannot find the date of mine. It's been so long a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try. And whether, could they choose between, they would not rather die. This is Emily Dickinson, writing contemporary of Ghalib, writing in 1850s and 60s also, and expressing in such a profound way what this journey is all about, that you talked about. How are we going to help someone for whom we know we don't have a cure? We know basically from based on experience and observation that we can't do anything medically to help. At this point, young doctors lose heart and their reaction to this helplessness is to withdraw because you become a little self-protective, self-defensive, and you feel so much pain seeing some another human being suffering whom you cannot help anymore with your medications. You can't cure them. You withdraw and, and kind of uh, try to detach yourself. And I am just the exact opposite of this. I tell all my trainees who are working under me that this is the time when you have to step in and double your efforts. Because you see, now when someone cannot imagine too far into the future because they know that they have a terminal illness or it, they can sense it, then when you cannot plan for the future, suddenly now becomes important. Every day you have is a blessing. Every moment you can spend with the loved ones becomes far more important. And as Ghalib said, Hasti ke mat fareb me ajai yo asad. Don't be trapped by the shenanigans of existence. Hasti ke mat fareb me ajai yo asad. Alam tamam halqay dame khayal hai. It's your internal life. It's your internal uh, psyche that has to be at this point, uh, reinforced to face the challenges coming your way. But this is also a very beautiful time for individuals to make peace with, with a lot of things that they have done in their lives. I'll give you a, a, a small story. I was traveling to Islamabad once a few years ago. 
And suddenly some perfectly normal looking American blonde, blue eyed woman comes up to me and says, aren't you Dr. Raza? And I said, yes. <laughs> How did you recognize me? She said, oh, you take care of my dad. And he's been your patient for like eight years. And then she mentioned his name. And I said, oh, my God, you're John's daughter. That's wonderful. Why are you going to Islamabad? She said, oh, my husband, uh, who's a historian, is going to give some lectures to the American embassy staff on history. I said, oh, so you, that means you're CIA. <laughs> she said, no, no, no. <laughs> we can't comment on that. But why would a couple going to Islamabad to give a, a talk on history to the American embassy. But anyway, that's very sweet. So her father had been my patient. We became such good friends because, you see, I see my patients every week. They have low blood counts. I have to give them blood and platelets and they get infected. We go through a whole journey. But some of them live a long time with the chronic stage of the disease. And so we had become very close. But when it came to the point that we couldn't do anything more, he asked me that, look, Dr. Raza, I just, he was already admitted as an inpatient. And he said, I think that I've had enough treatment and I'd like to make an informed decision. I don't want anything anymore. I said, fine, that's okay. We had many talks about possibilities. And then he went on hospice care. So every day during rounds, I would go to see him while he's on this hospice care in the hospital. And about a week later, when I went and I said, how are you doing, John? He sat me down and said, listen, I have seen every family al album that existed in the family going back like five generations. I have met every distant cousin who, have co who has come to visit me. I have said all my goodbyes to everybody. I've made my peace. Now I feel so good. And he said, Dr. Raza, all I want now, I'm excited to see what's on the other side waiting for me. I was so moved by this answer because here is a man who, while we took care of him on the inpatient and took care of his pain and nourishment, whatever we could go give intravenously and through nasogastric tubes, he had a chance to say goodbye to everybody, to see everyone's albums, to any relative who wanted to come and visit him. This is what I'm talking about. Patience, the individual shows so much courage, so much strength at this point in time that we must never underestimate the human spirit. The most ordinary, the most common person walking on the street when faced with the challenge will rise to it a more. And that is such a privilege to be able to even witness. So instead of withdrawing ourselves, this is the time when we should become more and more involved. Because it actually nourishes our own spirit. It gives us the courage. It gives us the inspiration to continue. And to me, by the way, I recite poetry to my patients all the time. And they expect it now. When they start, oh, please, and Ghalib. I translate Ghalib for them and recite for them. But here's one more I'll say before uh, we... Uh, um, stop with Emily Dickinson. Here's something she taught me. Um, and, and a metaphor is involved. And since your question is about that, here's something that I have always found very difficult when I was younger, especially that how do you tell a patient that they have a deadly disease and that it's not curable? Emily Dickinson helped me, as does Ghalib. Dickinson says, tell all the truth. You see, the admonition in this line is you can't hold anything back. You can't lie. You can't make up things. You can't give false hope. None of that. Tell all the truth, she says. But tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. Like lightning to the children, eased with explanations kind. You see, when children see lightning or hear the thunder, they get scared. And But as adults, we try to explain to them what it is and not to worry. And 
etc. So now listen to how she ends this. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. Like lightning to the children, eased with explanations kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. How beautiful is that? Yes, we are all dealing with difficult challenges in our lives. But the point is we need to be there to help each other. And metaphors and poetry, stories of individual heroism, I think they are so empowering. As a physician, when I walk into my clinic, honestly, Amo, it's like a love fest. It's so wonderful to feel so intimately connected to the patients and to be able to be walking with them every day in their journey. I think those are the most beautiful parts of being alive and having the privilege to be a doctor. Well, <clears throat> that is encapsulated beautifully. And that gets me to the Ghalib part. I'll come back to cancer. But Ghalib, incidentally, is uh, the Arabic word for all-conquering. And uh, <clears throat> one of his coup play, and before I recite this, uh, caveat emptor, my Urdu is uh, worse than it can be. So if I get it wrong, please pardon my Urdu, as they say for French. Aate hain ghaib se ye mazami khayal mein ghalo sarir e khama nawai sarosh hai. The poetry of Ghalo and the character of Ghalo in this conversation also becomes important because a uh, as a doctor in this, like, Ghalib is comparing himself or that he is uh, getting his wisdom directly from Reb or Gabriel. And he has this instinct connection. This transition from being a poet to a professor to a medical doctor to a clinical researcher, this kind of a circuit, how important is the role of poetry in bringing comfort, in joy, but also most importantly, and this is the part of the book uh, that is very hard for me to uh, work with, is that it's a long list of people, amazing people, people close to you, who have walked into the afterlife. How do you deal with it as a person? Uh, I think what you said about Ghalib is so true. He is uh, overwhelmingly overshadows everybody else. He is Ghalib. He has overpowered and overcome everyone. I am um, fond of saying, Ek shair tha Ghalib. Baki shair hain ghaliban. <laughs> we, the rest of uh, poetry is all footnotes to Ghalib, in my opinion. He was just so great. Um, but interestingly, where you come from, your cultural background, your education, your uh, social interactions, all of these things are what help you develop a, a strong inner life a resilience, uh, give you the inspiration to go through life, you know, but those are all things that are important. And for me, I was very fortunate in that my dad grew up in Lucknow and my mother grew up in Aligarh. At partition, they moved to the desert of Sindh, Karachi. Suddenly they landed in this arid city and they're coming from the high culture, the acme of high culture, Lucknow and Aligarh for Muslims. 
and poetry is crispered into their DNA. I mean, they can't help but recite shares all the time. In fact, you know, the Genesis story that, uh, that uh, Adam and Eve uh, were created uh, first and that they were given a choice, um, many, many uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, books of uh, that quote the Genesis story always come to this that they were ex exiled from heaven because they ate the forbidden fruit. Well, my uncle, my father's older brother, wrote this beautiful share. So beautiful. Chaman chuta to chuta tha. Mazake rango bu chuta. Yani, hamara garden, in this case, whatever, Hamara garden to agar chuta tha to chaman to chut gaya. Magar uske baad hua ye ke we can't, we even lost the delicacy of sense of fragrances and to appreciate the delicate things. Everything is gone with that. Chaman chuta to chuta tha, mazake rango bu chuta, chuti adam se jannat aur hum se laknau chuta. This is what my uncle had to say when they landed in Pakistan in Karachi because they were heartbroken at the division. Now, the thing that interesting thing that happened was they developed the immigrants' anxiety, which is that Hamari to itni ghazab ki tehzeeb thi ek hazar saal ki. Usko ab kis tarah apne bachon ko transfer karein? क्योंकि ये तो अब इस सहरा में पलेंगे और बढ़ेंगे और यहाँ क्या तहजीब कोई लोग ही नहीं थे उस वक्त तो उस... so that anxiety I think helped all their children because then they continuously would tell us stories about लखनऊ एंड अलीगढ़ and growing up in and then after their marriage they moved to Delhi so all three cities were central to our growing up and then the poetry they recited because their culture was such that no conversation was complete unless you quoted Ghalib, Meer, Anis, Josh, Akbal, Faz, you know. It was at one point we were getting 27 magazines every month in our home from India and Pakistan because my parents were, that was the level of their anxiety. Another thing they started was my mother started a library at her home and uh, through her women's club that she had organized. And so we had access to all kinds of books at home. People would come to our home to borrow books for the general community. Those kinds of things in the start of Pakistan uh, as a separate country helped us all in the sense that we became also deeply involved and just the culture got into our uh, genetic framework as well. And so um, we were also made to memorize hundreds and hundreds of verses of poetry. And my parents' scheme was very smart that we'll make the children memorize. And once they are old, of course, you can't understand Hasti ke mat fareb mein a jai yu asad as a five or six year old. But when they grow up and start reciting to themselves what they, they have learned, then they'll be forced to think about it and they will not... Uh, be able to escape because the poetry and the messages and the language is so ravishing that there's no way you can make any sense uh, of it. So I think that I was helped by a lot by the cultural background that I came from. And as a result, those are the very things, reading poetry, contemplating on what our great poets are saying. Um, here's an example. I uh, was speaking once to the Indian High Commissioner in Chicago, and he was reciting some Khalib to me, and I said, wow, I'm so impressed, Mr. Sharma. How did you develop an interest in Ghalib? He said, as a 17, 18-year-old, he read a Sher, which he started thinking about seriously, and that turned him on to Ghalib. And that Sher he read was a very sweet Sher. 
um it's from that ghazal um औरों पे है वो जुल्म जो मुझ पे ना हुआ था एंड इट्स इट्स रियली अ गॉर्जियस गजल ही कम्स टू दिस शेर इन इट दरियाए मासी तुनुक आबी से हुआ खुश्क दरिया एज यू नो रिवर मासी इज सिंस द रिवर ऑफ सिंस दरियाए मासी तुनुक आबी से हुआ खुश्क यानी उसमें इतना जोश आया इतने ज्यादा वो हुआ कि वो खुश्क हो गया ड्राई हो गया दरिया ड्राई हो गया क्यों सेकंड लाइन विल टेल यू द रिवर ऑफ सिन ड्राइड इट सेल्फ दरिया मासी तनु काबी से हुआ खुश्क मेरा सरे दामन भी अभी तर ना हुआ था इट हैडेंट इवन टच द सरे दामन मीनिंग के अभी तो मेरे दामन का सिरा भी यानी वो भी तर नहीं हुआ था कि दरिया खुश्क हो गया मीनिंग आई हैव सो मच पोटेंशियल इन मी दैट आई कैन अब्जॉर्ब एन एंटायर रिवर एंड नॉट इवन माई सरे दामन विल बिकम नाउ यू थिंक अबाउट दिस अमोक दिस शेयर कैन अप्लाई टू ऑल काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स बट हाउ एम्पावरिंग इज इट for example i can say the same for human creativity human imagination there is no limit to it it's infinite so darya imagination to nuka bhi se hua khushk mera sare damar it all depends on in another sheer ghalib in the same ghazal in another sheer he says something even more beautiful i think he says तोफीक ब अंदाज हिम्मत है अजल से मीनिंग यू कैन ओनली डू वॉट यू डेयर टू डू इज वॉट यू विल अकॉम्प्लिश दैट इफ यू डोंट डेयर यूर नॉट गोइंग टू अकॉम्प्लिश एनी थिंग जितनी हिम्मत आप में है उतनी आप में तोफीक होगी आप जितनी कर सकें तोफीक ब अंदाज हिम्मत है अजल से आंखों में है वो कतरा जो गौहर ना हुआ था इट्स द सेम गजल दरिया मासी तुनु काबी से हुआ खुश्क मेरा सर दामन भी अभी तर न हुआ था तोफीक ब अंदाज है हिम्मत है अजल से आंखों में है वो कतरा जो गौहर न हुआ था आई टेक अ मिनट टू एक्सप्लेन दिस वी हैव अ मिथ इन आर पोइट्री इन आर लिंग्विस्टिक ट्रेडिशन दैट इट इज ओनली द फर्स्ट रेन ड्रॉप फर्स्ट ड्रॉप ऑफ द सीजन फर्स्ट रेन्स विच इफ गेट इन टू द इन टू अ क्लैम विल बिकम अ पर्ल नाउ वॉट इफ यू आर नॉट द फर्स्ट फ्यू रेन ड्रॉप देन यू हैव नो चांस ऑफ बिकमिंग अ पर्ल राइट बिकॉज द मिथ इज दैट इट्स ओनली द फर्स्ट फ्यू रेन ड्रॉप दैट बिकम हैव इवन अ चांस ऑफ बिकमिंग अ पर्ल सो हेयर इन दिस शेयर गालिब इज प्रोवाइडिंग कॉन्सुलेशन टू दोज ड्रॉप्स हु आर नॉट द फर्स्ट एंड वॉट अ ब्यूटिफुल थिंग इज ए सो वॉट इफ यू आर नॉट द फर्स्ट एंड यू कूडेंट बिकम अ पर्ल नाउ यू हैव अ चांस ऑफ becoming part of the ocean getting evaporated becoming a cloud becoming rain a lover drinks it and now that water comes out of the eyes of a lover as a tear you have a chance to do that so ghalib's idea is that the pearl is great but the pearl is an inanimate inorganic dead thing it's beautiful but it's not alive whereas a drop of a tear that comes out of a lover's eye the anguish that it's expressing in a living thing is so far superior and so i say as a metaphor as a thinking about what gives me courage is the cure pearl is the cure part it's great if you find that gem of a cure but healing is different than cure and healing is what the tears are all about and how beautifully has ghalib taught me the difference between healing and cure and why be satisfied with one or the other try to do both well um, it's um, very very beautifully put uh <clears throat> 
I am now going to get back to rather mundane lab related question and then come back to Alec. Uh, I think I really like the, the this conversation as two different poles that balance each other out. Uh, in your book, when you're describing the first cell, so my first uh, assumption on knowing the title of the book was the first cell would be, you know, like you have a lot of these books that come out that say uh, there is an off, there is a there's a possibility of cure just around the curve. You make that very clear yeah. that perhaps in your lifetime, in our lifetime, it might not be uh, possible. But then you go on to list out different things that are frozen in time that we just talked about. But one, there's a place where you describe cells. How do they get big? Where is that first cell? Where is that first biomarker that can be found? And you talk about flight, fight, flight, or freeze, and the creation of this first cell, and then the work that is done in the lab. Uh, if I'm not wrong, is it called somatic pregnancy? Is that the correct term? <laughs> so in all of this, uh, when you look at the lab work, what is the stress, because you explain this very beautifully in the book, but there are a lot of people here and a lot of people who would uh, watch this later. The idea of stress, you know, when we think about cancer and stress, and I was also under the impression that it's the same kind of stress that um, governments are trying to warn you about when they think about, say, heart attack, uh, the CVT. But it's not that stress, is it? What is this stress that leads to cancer? What is this? Where do, do these 200 complicated forms of cancer come from? And also, is there a possibility that there could be another form of cancer sometime in the future? 201, 202, 203. These are three questions clubbed together. Very sorry for that. Um. Yeah, well, first of all, let me read a share for you. Zakhm phalta hai mustakil barso. Hadsa ek dam nahi hota. Most things are take a long time to really reach a phase transition point where they turn from one thing to another. And since I have been a medical student and even before that reading a lot about cancer, uh, the thing that has fascinated me is that within our bodies, we give birth to a new kind of life which can live forever. It's immortal. Cancer is literally the formation of a new species because the moment a cancer cell is born, it starts treating the rest of the body as foreign land. It's trying to survive in, a, in an adverse environment, so to say. So why has that happened? Why have we in our own body given birth to something like that, that can live forever? But then it occurred to me that if we can unlock the secret of a cancer cell, we can unlock the secret of aging. And in fact, that was the initial intellectual fascination I had for wanting to study cancer. It's like the drug Ozempic. You are trying to treat diabetes, but the side effect is everyone's losing weight and looking fantastic now, like they belong on the cover of Vogue. So, you know, we can cure cancer, but can the side effect be longevity? You know, yeah, sure, because cancer is the biggest risk to life in old age. Aging is the worst carcinogen. So cancer is a disease of the aging. The point I'm making is that how we give birth to this new species doesn't happen overnight because of a genetic mutation. The genetic mutation is occurring, but because something is causing the cell to behave abnormally, right? And what is that, that kind of signaling pathway, that surrounding which is forcing cells to either fight or flight, develop a new strategy to survive or die. And so 
in that is what I call a stress. So let's see how can stress be produced. One is mental kind of stress, but that's also bad. However, here we are talking about a stress within an organ. Let's take liver. In the liver, there is an infection with the hepatitis B virus, for example. Now, that infection is causing an inflammatory response in the liver. The viruses are dividing, killing cells, and cells are suddenly under stress that either we have to develop a strategy to survive or we die. And one strategy they under stress is two cells fuse, boom. They double their genome immediately. Now, every gene they had is doubled, so they can fight much better. Cooperation rather than competition comes in handy at this point. But the weird thing is that sometimes a liver cell under stress will fuse not with another liver cell, which happens a lot under stress, but with a blood cell. The blood and immune cell from the blood had come to the liver to try and clean up the poisoned microenvironment instead of it cleaning up and by eating up these dying cells, the dying cell is not really dying. It gets in under stress, fuses its genome with that of a blood, and now as a result becomes mobile because blood cells can go all over. So this cell hiding inside, the liver cell hiding inside a blood cell can now travel all over the body. Cancer is the only disease in which cells walk out of their organ of origin. A liver tumor can end up in the bones, in the brain. You know that. Yeah. Somebody's breast cancer is in the lungs. How is this cell able to walk out? Because it's hiding inside a blood cell as a camouflage and goes all over. And so I'm talking, the stress I'm talking about to an organ is the stress caused by infections, by exposure to toxins uh, like asbestos, you know, things like that like exposure to radiation, uh, all kinds of stresses that can happen, autoimmune diseases, any chronic inflammation is a stressful condition for the organ, and that will force cells to misbehave. The thing about cancer is, though, that I feel very strongly that the, we will be able to cure cancer soon, but not by finding a magic bullet for end-stage cancer, rather by finding the first cell and eliminating it. No, even before that, finding the stress that is causing the appearance of the first cell and removing the stress so it doesn't even cause that first cell to appear. And with the technology that is available now to study genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, glycomics, everything from a few drops of blood, saliva, urine, feces, hair, nails, any compartment, we can examine for these uh, markers, these little footprints of stress. And these can be generated continuously from the human body into an eye cloud above each individual's head that's constantly analyzed by artificial intelligence and a signal is sent to your iPhone that, hey, there's some stress going on in blah, blah organ, you know, that kind of thing. At this stage, even lifestyle changes will matter. Stop smoking, stop drinking, eat healthy, exercise. Those things are not helpful when you have end-stage cancer. Those things are helpful early on, right? So first of all, what I'm saying is very much the technology is there now where we can find the biomarkers, the footprints of cancer as it's starting to evolve, as the first cells are coming out. And that's the strategy has to be followed. And my whole life has been spent in trying to turn the focus of the field from the last cell to the first cell because 95% of resources, intellectual and material, are being spent in chasing the last cell and trying to kill it and hurting patients in the bargain and hurting them financially as well because each drug is costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Only 5% goes to early detection and prevention and most of it is spent on anti-obesity, anti-smoking campaigns. Very little on actually early detection. My 
uh, I'm beseeching the researchers for God's sake, recognize that cancer is too complicated a disease. You can't cure it in end stage like we couldn't cure heart disease. End stage, we couldn't cure infectious disease. Even today, when someone's septic, we can't cure them easily. But if we can prevent it much better, same strategy has to be for cancer and all chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, neurologic disease, everything has to be found early. So I'm begging everybody in the field that for God's sake, start investing intellectual and material resources into earliest detection of even the stress markers. Does that make sense to you? It does, absolutely. And uh, this is what I was fascinated by in the book, because between the case studies, there is a lot of, as I said, I am slightly uneducated, uh, but majorly uneducated because I'm an economist. So I had to look up a lot of stuff and go back to read parts in the literature. I have, uh, there are some people who joined in who might want to have questions and an hour has flown by. I have multiple questions, but I'm going to let go of most of them ask you two. Uh, the first is to take a line from a couple from uh, Meer Taki Meer, Kya Budh Poochte Ho Poorab Ke Saakeno. And continuing on this, uh, what has been the role of the think tank that you have assembled? Because I think you were the first person to uh, collect samples going back. And still, uh, I think you still continue to collect samples from different cancer patients, what you were just talking about. But you also put together a think tank of leading specialists from different institutions, uh, the, on the, can the, the cancer think tank, the oncology think tank. Um, how successful do you think uh, between the publication of this book and now, uh, four to five years have gone by, uh, how popular is this idea getting? The first cell narrative that instead of going after the end stage, let's try and focus our resources on the first cell. Have you made significant progress? Huge progress in two areas. My first thing was I started by studying and treating acute leukemia. I realized that's too end stage. I have to go. I said, we have to find cancer before it finds us, which means instead of studying cancer patients, I should study people at high risk of cancer, follow them until they develop cancer. So there is something called pre-leukemia, a condition in which a third of the patients will develop acute leukemia. So I started studying these pre-leukemia patients and following them till they develop leukemia or died of their pre-leukemia. And so in 1984, I said to myself, two things I must do. If I'm going to cure cancer, then it has to be that I study human samples. I'm not going to study animals because I don't want to cure animals. I want to cure humans. So only study human samples, not mouse and uh, rats. And second, early stage follow as they become worse. And for all of these three decades, four decades, I have stayed faithful to my commitment on these two things, early detection, human samples. I started saving human blood, bone marrow, saliva, all these things since 1984. And today I have the largest tissue repository in the world as a single physician. Not one cell comes from another oncologist. Over 60,000 samples on thousands of patients longitudinally obtained. And these are what are so precious as the disease progresses, what has changed? What causes that phase transition from pre-leukemia to leukemia? What markers could we detect from two drops of blood in these patients? It's all coming to fruition. And I am so excited that I said to myself, why am I the only one saying this? So I started calling up my colleagues at, uh, for example, at Harvard, at Johns Hopkins, at MD Anderson, at University of Chicago, the biggest institutions in the country. 
and saying to the leadership in oncology there that either you point out the fatal flaw in my argument that early detection is the way to go and human samples is the way to study it, either point out what I'm saying wrong or join the revolution. And everyone joined the revolution. So I made this think tank and we met for 17 meetings, two hour long meetings on Zoom, of course. And we came to a consensus, the opinion paper we published in Scientific American in 2021. And our consensus was that we need to find again the first cell. But by the time cancer is diagnosed today, there are hundreds of millions of cells, even in the tiniest tumor. So we can't even go to stage one cancer. We have to go to the first cell, which means try to find people at risk of developing cancer. Well, one is pre-leukemia to leukemia. But what about solid cancers like lung and breast and prostate and ovarian cancers? How do we find the pre-cancer stage there? And then it comes to mind that there is there are several such groups who are at risk of developing cancers like the mutations in genes called BRCA1 and 2. Angelina Jolie, the famous film actress here, she got uh, massive uh, surgeries done on her body because she has inherited these mutations and is at very high risk of getting cancer. So there's one group. But another group is cancer survivors. You know that one in five new cancers, 20% of new cancers appear in a cancer survivor. So these cancer survivors are all anyway connected to their cancer centers because they keep going for follow-up of their original cancer. But then they can develop a completely unrelated new cancer. I'm not talking about a recurrence. I'm talking about an unrelated new cancer. That can happen. So when these people are coming to the cancer centers, I said to the oncology think tank, why not just collect their samples as they come for follow-ups and keep following them? If enough centers do it, within two years, we will have thousands of patients who have developed a second cancer. Now we have caught their first cell. We have caught all the biomarkers that led up to their developing the second cancer. So do you know that I've already finished the pilot trial for this with 500 patients, uh, 500 cancer survivors. Many of them have already developed a second tumor. And we have caught their first cells. Now we are extending to Johns Hopkins and MD Anderson, two institutions, and then we'll go to the rest of the think tank centers. But I need $40 million. And there are so many people among that have stepped up to help me do this. Why? Because I have been at it for 30 years. I'm not someone they can easily discard. I'm someone who continues to see 30 to 40 cancer patients every week, even now. I do all the bone marrows with my own hands, draw the bloods with my own hands. Second, I have a very busy basic research lab that's very well funded for 35 years. So I'm an oncologist seeing patients. I'm a cancer researcher at the basic level. And finally, I'm a cancer widow. So what angle or what area of cancer are you going to be lecturing me about? Because this is what I do for my life's uh, uh, committed commitment and quest. And... I have to say the people are so wonderful. My colleagues at every institution, even though they are working in end stage issues, they have joined me and are willing to help out. Then people who I appeal to, the National Foundation for Cancer Research has just said the next five years, all the funds they raise, they are going to donate or devote to my idea of developing a tissue repository of cancer survivors. What a huge thing that is. Multiple billionaires and philanthropists have stepped in. My patients have stepped in writing checks for this project. And fine, so I would say that I'm hugely um, feeling satisfied with the kind of response I've gotten from my colleagues. 
even though the response to the book was as if I've written the satanic verses of medicine. <laughs> because no one wanted to, to be told that what you're doing is irrelevant and hurting patients. However, when I appeal to them one-to-one, -one, there's no way they are going to say no because they understand what I'm saying is right. We have to find cancer early. So I'm very thankful to my colleagues and to my funders. But second thing I want to say it made a difference to President Biden. He signed off a bill just in 2023, uh, November, I believe, saying that we do not require animal models as a uh, as a uh, something mandated by law, which is a law that was written in 1912 that has existed until now, saying that we cannot bring a drug to the human bedside until we have tested in mice. Well, we showed after all these years of testing in mice, it's irrelevant. What you find in mice doesn't apply to humans. So why are we wasting our resources on trying these things? President Biden, with one signature, took away that law. And all because of, you know, the crusade that I have been engaged in since uh, 1984. But it takes a long time, and this is why many young people I see are on this call. You don't give up. That's the thing. You don't give up your quest. If you think you are doing something that makes sense, even though it's not bringing dividends immediately, look, it's taken me decades to get heard even. But I keep changing and assaulting the field in all different directions. Book was just one of them, Amok, that I wrote a book and called out everybody's bluff. That no, you are not helping cancer patients. The end stage patients at best, you are prolonging their survival by median of 2.1 months for 30% patients. And you are financially bankrupting 42% patients newly diagnosed with cancer in America. That's not a victory lap for God's sake. That's a sign of complete failure. And I called this, called out all this in my book. That's why it's treated as a satanic verses, like I said. But on the other hand, it's hard to deny what I'm saying. That, that is correct. That is absolutely correct. It is hard to deny, and I don't think it should be denied. Uh, I'm going to, one last question. I'm going to keep it very brief. As I said, I have multiple, but I'm pretty sure there are people here. In fact, I have got questions from people who are attending, who are not attending or could not attend it today to ask you, should the time permit? But last question before I open it up. Um, the American healthcare model, uh, to use a word Ghalib would, would have used in the aftermath of 1857, the dozak of the American healthcare system, the insurance payers, the private equity people, this model is taking over the world, you know. And there was a recent report uh, <clears throat> put out by my good friends in the UK that when private equity comes to town, when they take over hospitals and hospice care and, you know, everything becomes about business and the bottom line and the annual statements, uh, patient care goes out of the window. And that is a model that is being exported to large parts of the world, be it India, be it Pakistan, be it Bangladesh, because uh, capital is always going to find new avenues to keep on expanding its reach. How do we take back, and this is a question that I ask every person who works in the American healthcare system, because the people, people like you, people who are actively working to reduce the pain, they are reduce, they're working to bring empathy back on the table. But all of that goes away when venture capital, private equity is in town. How do we get the doctors, the hospitals to care again? Because without that, everything else is lost, is it not? I mean, these are profound questions and concerns that I could take hours to respond to also. But I think one of the most important things, koi karma se tuta, koi badguma haram se. Haram is meaning your ultimate goal. 
वही आपके लिए उससे ही बदगुमान आप हो गए कि मे बी इट्स नॉट वर्थ इट कारवा इज अ कैरोवैन कोई कारवा से टूटा कोई बदगुमा हरम से के अमीर कारवा में नहीं हुए दिल नवाजी दैट द लीडर ऑफ द कैरोवैन इज द वन हु इज अनएबल टू इंस्पायर द काइंड ऑफ डिवोशन एंड कमिटमेंट दैट इज नीडेड फॉर दिस जर्नी so first of all i lay the blame solidly on the leadership because they are the ones handing out the grants and there is the abject failure of the institutions the very institutions that are assigned the responsibility of protecting patients are throwing the patients under the bus they are the ones approving drugs fda is the one approving drugs that will improve survival by 2.9 one month why because they are under pressure from lobbying groups from patients uh, advocacy groups etc but you are not supposed to come under pressure from things like that you are supposed your job is to protect the patient above everything else who says 2.1 months for someone like andrew 22 year old how dare we tell his mother that we can pro prolong the survival of your son there's a 30% chance by 2 months when he's 22 and dying of a brain tumor that's that's the kind of thing that i feel is completely um has to be acknowledged that it's starting from the very top and we shouldn't just blame for example pharmaceutical companies or commer their interest is to make money for their shareholders they don't hide it that is their purpose of existence right but the purpose of existence of proper institutions to lead the way is different than companies so first of all that's a real problem secondly i was having this discussion the other day that in the west there is a very stark separation between athens and jerusalem reason and passion right they make a stark distinction in the east we have kind of a weaving in and out which is to me a healthier way where this is why i can quote poetry from galib in a book on cancer because we have a seamless transition between athens and jerusalem between passion and reason because at a fundamental level our poets understood that in fact reason is also bolstered and initiated by passion if i just had an intellectual interest in cancer and trying to solve a cancer problem of a cell i wouldn't have the same investment as i do now by seeing patients and being inspired by their suffering and having my emotions involved in their emotions so passion and reason have to be together but then the problem is this amok and i want everyone to think about this problem and tell me what you think if we thought that reason is fantastic and the renaissance came in europe and everything was suddenly undergoing such wonderful revolutions they develop the highest most exquisite forms of poetry and music and literature and philosophy in the 15 16 to 1800s 1900s the acme of culture and civilization in europe and the feeling was that if human cognition reaches a certain level of civilization to appreciate fine poetry and fine painting and beautiful music then we won't be able to do bad things and yet at the acme of their civilization what do they do they have the world wars destroying europe so reason passion levels of education in the end nothing matters what mattered was the leadership right fighting with each other for what for resources so in the end you are an economist you understand it's all about money everything boils down to colonialism everything boils down to money which then gets you the resources and the power so in cancer it's no different honestly and that's why 
even if I'm not succeeding, this is what I, beautiful share by Fani. Nakam hai to kya hai? Kuch kaam phir bhi kar ja. <laughs> Nakam hai to kya hai? Kuch kaam phir bhi kar ja. Mardana var ji aur mardana var mar ja. Until you die, stay faithful and devoted to your quest for which you believe strongly, whatever it is. And I, I really feel that it's so important to have a larger view of things. Humans, all of us, have so many weaknesses. And we try to bolster our inner life and find strength in religion or in poetry or in music and whatever customs we have. But each one of us is trying to have the courage to face the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that are thrown at us every day. And reason alone does not provide it. And passion alone does not provide it. And I wanted you all to think about, okay, then what should the message be? Combining reason and passion, but then we are stymied by, I mean, look what's happening in the Middle East. Look what's happening here. Look what's happening in this country, in America. The country has become divided into two completely different ideologies. Um, why is this all happening suddenly? Why aren't we all, why hasn't reason prevailed? And why haven't we been able as humans? Well, we can't. That is our nature is so flawed in a way. And so I want all of us to think about it. And my only solution, Amok, which is a very, maybe uh, something that you won't agree with, but I feel that the only solution is what Voltaire said at the end of his novel, Candide. The last sentence is, we can only and we must nurture our own God. And in the end, stop worrying about what you can do to change the world. Worry more about how, what can you do to change yourself and improve yourself and nurture yourself. But he uses the word nurture your own garden. So a garden is something where you will... Uh, you will be uh, growing beautiful plants and flowers that will be of benefit to others who can gain the nutrition from it. So the community is helped, you know, it's not just. So do something so productive and so beautiful to enhance your own knowledge, your own self, your own ideas, your own habits that in a way that helped the community. And this is my only solution. Whether it combines reason or passion, the work has to be on yourself. And don't worry about other things. What do you think of it, Amo? I think uh, I I agree. But I agree with the earlier part as well, that the blame lies on the higher administration. But we also have to work on ourselves in different things, in professional and personal capacities. And uh, only a person who traverses both the worlds of CP Snow you know, science and art can could have brought it together. Thank you so much for doing it. May I, with your permission, I've taken, you've taken a lot of your time. Open it up to questions. <clears throat> we have uh, with us uh, Professor Nag, who's actually, uh, I, he's a member of the board of Asia. So would you have any comments, questions? Because I see three uh, questions. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Professor Raza. I'm so overwhelmed by what all you have said that I have no question at all. I'm trying to process it. As you were talking, I have ordered the book, and I must confess something I should have done before this session, but I couldn't or I didn't, so I look forward to it. Uh, but the very last point, something that uh, you made, uh, ultimately it all depends on us. The trouble with the issue of, and I agree entirely with the issue of leadership, that leadership is you know, to be responsible. I think there's then a question of how do we get that leadership? How do we 
get the leadership that would respond for the all of this and that's of course a sixty four thousand dollar question you are going through a very uh i suppose uh difficult process of finding your leaders and so are we i just hope it'll all all work out but uh i really don't have any I just want to thank you for opening certainly my uh, eyes and thoughts to more thoughts and questions because I want to understand. I'll try to, through Amo, get in touch with you to seek some clarification and education. But thank you very much for doing this for us, Professor Raza. Thank you for your lovely comments. And look forward to hearing from you after you've read the book. Send me a full book report. <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly write to you. Thank you. I look forward to it. We also Dr. Raza, uh, I, I mean, absolutely uh, touched with what you have uh, said. Unfortunately, I haven't read the book. Probably I should, uh, I should get it and read it. I think uh, as a long-term survivor, a few things touched me or you know, touched the cord. Uh, you spoke about the, how difficult it is for a doctor to you know, speak the truth. And I think what, for me, I found, yes, being told that you have the disease is one, but I didn't want to hear about inferences because I wanted to hold on to hope so that I was comfortable with this is what you need to do. This is what you need to take forward. And I was fortunate enough to have, you know, other people who were willing to listen to the inferences and the implications that might be there. For me, the message of hope was absolutely vital. The relationship with the doctor, which you, which you've called out, I think, with so much poetry and the kind of balancing out the passion and the reason. I think I was lucky enough to have a doctor like that as well. So I, again, it touched touched me profoundly. I really like the fact where your research is going, finding the first cell. But as someone who has to go for those tests on a regular basis, um, I came across a study, and I don't know how good, bad it is. It was not in the, con in the context of cancer, but it was in the context of tuberculosis. They tried to do the, you know, the Schrodinger's cat, the observer precipitates the uh, whatever it is. And for me, that was something, uh, if we are able to find the first cell without the person going through the kind of stress that um, we, you know, uh, we go through when you go for the test, it, I can tell you I have a serious white coat syndrome. So if there's a way that could also be included in you know, what you were talking about, the uh, using AI and the kinds of it, that would be absolutely fantastic. And I'd love to stay in touch to see if there's something we can do to make the survivor look at it differently. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm a really long-term survivor. But on the other hand, you also know the stress that one, one goes through with it. I couldn't agree more with everything you've said. I'm very sorry you had to go through the journey, but delighted that you communicated and clicked with your oncologist. That is the key. And I'm so happy to see that you look fantastic and you're doing very well and you will continue to do well. Um, the answer to your question is again, I mean, of course, what you've expressed is a universal concern. The anxiety is there. What's your name, by the way? I'm Sandhya Vasudevan. Sorry? Sandhya. My name is Sandhya. Sandhya. Uh, recently, I was talking to a colleague who said, Azra, you know that by, by 2050, we will be able to tell individuals that um, you can practically live for a thousand years. Basically, the only threat to your life is accidents. And do you know what will humans do? They will spend the maximum time worrying about accidents now. Instead of enjoying the immortality <laughs> they have gained, <laughs> their anxiety will all That's be true. focused on, there is a chance I could die. So, yeah, I mean, it's mm. perfect. 
natural what you're saying that uh, I mean you want to avoid ever having to go to be tested for anything and least of all to find out that you have uh, the birth of a cell that could take your life yeah but the only time we should be doing this is when we have a solution to take out the first cell so when you are confident that if I go and find the first cell it can be zapped like in no time mm -hmm. I agree IT will go away and that's what we are trying to do. And I think Amok, you referred to me having a company which I was forced into kicking and screaming because that is the way things are done here. That after a certain level, when you want to bring your bench insights to the bedside, you need hundreds of millions of dollars to mm -hmm. do this. So what I'm trying to do through the company, which has required hundreds of millions of dollars, is to take out the first cell. And that's the time when we should be offering the tests to find the first cell. When we have the treatment, they all must go mm -hmm. evolve. But for that, we have to focus on it first. We have to take mm -hmm. away the kind of things we are doing and refocus our efforts. So thank you, Sandhya, for asking such a, I mean, for making, being an ambassador of patients, for helping us come back to the real issues that are involved, that we are all humans, we are in this together, we have to help each other. Cancer doesn't know who's a Pakistani, who's an Indian, who's a yeah. Democrat, who's a Republican. No, cancer strikes. I mean, it entered my own home and took away my yes. husband, the prime of his life. My daughter is four years old. I mean, there's just yeah. no one who's spared anymore. Yeah. And we have to help each other beyond all these castes and definitions of race and nation and uh, whatever we fence ourselves with. Doctor, just a question. When you're doing this study, are you seeing um, uh, the demographic differences, you know, because of whether someone is Caucasian, Asian, love, you know, the various things, and are they... Obviously, uh, certain types of cancers are linked to male and female. But, uh, no, I'm not. Let me just say that I'm not into epidemiology. And is I don't... there enough diversity of data? Because, I mean, I was involved with a startup which is looking at the gut biome. So... I think she's getting frozen a more. Uh, I I think uh, I think uh, Ms. Vasavi, when you are getting frozen, and uh, I leave it at that. I, I'm not sure. I, I thought I, I saw others getting frozen, so that means I must be. I leave this point as is. So no, I understand. You're you're focused on a specific space, so it makes absolute sense. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. So I've got four questions. Do and I don't know if I have enough time, uh, Professor. Uh, really... yes. I mean, I have all the time, but please give me time to read a poem for you before I go. Right, but we still have four questions. Should we oh, send? <laughs> Should we send them over to you via email? No, no. Ask away. We'll answer them. Okay. So uh, the first question is from Neeti. You've been interacting uh, with her as part of getting this done. So uh, she thanks you for the session, and then. How does the involvement of artificial intelligence play a crucial role in shaping preventive care strategies, uh, products, and vision for cancer? I think, Neeti, you've been wonderful to me. Thank you so much for all your emails you. and keeping me on track and everything, sending the questions, some of them in advance. That was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Actually, AI is going to be the most important thing for all of us in everything we do. And uh, of course, uh, science and medicine, especially, that's where it's going to completely revolutionize how we do things. And uh, in terms of the first cell, as I said, we have the samples now. We can use the technology to analyze them. And we have petabytes of data that will come out of it that can only be analyzed by something like AI. And it will come up with signatures that we don't understand, that AI doesn't understand, but it has the signature. It can distinguish already between a normal cell versus a malignant cell. 
And so those are the places where AI is being used. I'm involved in a project right now where we are trying to develop a fundamental chat GPT kind of thing for biology, which means that we are training the AI on cells of every single species known. You know, uh, what, what genes are, for example, in a zebra fish, what genes are upregulated, what are silenced, what are downregulated, what are the transcription factors. So these all exist, but we want to bring this all together in such a way that in the very near future, you will just have to show AI a cell and it will tell you this is coming from an ant, this is coming from a fish, this is coming from a human, this is, you know, can you believe all that is happening? So we are working very hard at very fundamental levels to completely revolutionize everything. And the old ways are going, going, gone. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Khan, you have a question? May I request you to please... Uh... I think... Uh, You're muted, oh. Dr. Khan. Professor Khan, you need to need to unmute yourself, please. Uh, hello. <clears throat> so, Professor Raza, I was very much engrossed in your lecture. I am Vahida and I am a psychologist by training. So, I was thinking when you were talking about that... Uh, uh, we have to, it has, it is a war against, uh, cancer is a war. So I was thinking that it is also a psychological war. If we talk about uh, precipitating factors or outcome factors, then again, we have to go through a psychological trauma, psychological pain. You talked about distress, etc. in signal cells. So, so many things overlapping with our, you talked about psyche also. So um, it's really um, a war, psychological war. So along with physical, psychological war has to be. So it becomes much more complicated. Uh, your presentation, your metaphors using uh, Valib, I think it's a way to deal with the um, disease, which is uh, which doesn't give you hope. But I think with the advancement of technology and your research and all other researches which are going on, giving us a hope. So hope is the ultimate, I think, solution, or you can say, uh, which has to be uh, remain alive. Uh, I was thinking that sometimes it is also sad that it is a disease of uh, uh, rich people. So the uh, because Amor is a health economics, uh, he, he he is a health economics uh, person. So uh, we can we see that many people who are affected by this, they they are not able to carry forward with this disease because of the economic pressure which they have. And we know that if cancer is there, the person will think that they are going to become bankrupt. And I have personally seen in my family that all the, um, the treating with cancer or going through chemotherapy and all treatment, the person became a back bankrupt. So the trauma is much more about the economic aspect rather than focusing on the disease. So uh, your work is tremendous. And I think one has to take uh, preventive or measures. It's very, very important to look or to go through the first cell. So I would like to go through your book and we'll see that what kind of psychological aspects we may uh, investigate and research on in that direction. One of my scholar, has worked with uh, cancer patients uh, uh, at a stage one breast cancer patient, and he used hypnotherapy to alleviate uh, the patient's pain. And it was very useful at that point of time, along with psychopharmacology, psychological treatment helped a lot in overcoming, at least at that point of time, their trauma, their pain. So I, I, I think uh, we may have to adopt a very uh, inclusive or holistic approach to deal with such kind of uh, chronic or we can say diseases which need a lot of research in future also. Thank you for your lecture. It, it, is, it is really amazing uh, that you have not focused 
only on the physical aspects but how one can deal with this kind of uh, challenge or pandemic it's going to be pandemic we have seen that in kashmir number of people are affected by cancer when i talked to my students i found that each and every family having so that stress factor is the very very important factor which has to be dealt with so um, the options are many and uh, we have to really work on this uh, prevention of uh, this disease uh, by adopting um making it is a movement in our community and i think your uh, guidance and your work is really tremendous which gives us motivation and inspiration thank you so much for such a uh, beneficial and very informative lecture thank you so much thank you thank you professor khan um <clears throat> Professor Raza, I'm not going to ask you the other yeah, yeah. questions that have uh, are there. I'm going to ask you a last one. Uh, this is from my colleague Abhilasha. Uh, um, Abhilasha, why don't you ask this question? Because I'm not able to quite kind of really understand. Yes, uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, <clears throat> Ma'am, um, um, so I lost my father a while ago um, to cancer. And um, the reason um, for this was that we couldn't just it it just couldn't di couldn't couldn't get diagnosed, and um, we were not. Um, he used to complain of an abdominal pain, and that is how the treatment started. Uh, we were told that um, he's got a stone in his bladder which needs to get uh, removed, and a very simple endoscopic procedure will be done and he left with that and he never came back and uh, um, he went for that and then they said something happened some clinical um, thing respiratory concern happened and uh, the waters entered into his lungs and he was put into a ventilator he was on ventilator for 27 days and then suddenly we would we were told that there's some tumors that are being are, are visible around his stomach. And in the next two days, we were told that he has fourth stage cancer. So um, we didn't get any time. So in a, in a, in a, in a span of a month, um, from a gallbladder stone to a removable and operational tumor, it, it, it was transformed into a large stage cancer. And then in a period of one month, um, I lost my father. So that is where I wanted to understand that what what is how do how do we even get to know that you know the cancer is there like what is the starting point of it is it is it to do something with our lifestyle because to my understanding my father had a had a very very perfect lifestyle you know he was somebody who used to be at home eat home food uh, he used to work out he used to exercise. So is it something that that we do somewhere wrong in our daily lifestyle? It's the society that we live in. Or is it something which is there in our body and, you know, we might just not get to know about it? Because, of course, as individuals, we are not that educated about it. So that is that is primarily what I wanted to understand, ma'am. So sorry to hear about what happened with your dad and please accept our deepest sympathies on your loss. You you are very young to have lost a uh, father, but it's very important that you shared this story with us, Abhilasha, because what you are saying is proving the point that cancer is a silent killer. It can reach stage four before producing any symptoms, you see. And that's what happened with your dad. It's not that in one month he went from being completely normal to having this. No, it's a, it has it had been there for a while, but the symptoms are, we can't afford to wait for symptoms is what my point is. We have to find it early. You said, is this something within us? Of course it is. It's the misbehavior of normal cells that causes cancer. So yes, it is within us, but the stresses that are causing it to behave Third important thing you said is about your father had a pristine lifestyle. Why did he get cancer? Nobody knows. But one example I'll give you. 
one bottle plastic bottle of water that we drink from every day contains 240,000 plastic particles that we are putting in us. 240,000 in each bottle of water. So he thinks he is drinking maybe very safe water, but on the other hand, we are introducing all kinds of carcinogens in our body every day that we don't even know. The unknown, unseen, unsuspected carcinogens we are breathing in, we are imbibing, uh, even though we think we are leading a good lifestyle. But it can also be that within the body there is an autoimmune reaction and disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or just aging. Aging alone causes all kinds of inflammatory situations in the bones, in the joints, in the organs, everywhere. And that's why cancer is really related to age. So no one can pinpoint what happened to your father. All we can say is that if he did not have such a pristine and healthy lifestyle, this cancer might have manifested and taken his life 20 years before. So instead of thinking that he died in the prime of his life, which is very sad, despite a good lifestyle, think that it was his lifestyle that postponed this from happening early. And you must also now yourself maintain the healthiest lifestyle possible in every way, shape or form. And that includes being screened for cancer. Even though you're young, you have a family history. And last thing I'd say is Amog asked me the question that there are 200 types of known cancers. Is there a chance of a new one coming up? I say, yeah, because of all the new carcinogens we are adding. Who knows? There's always a new surprise that's waiting for us. And as scientists and uh, as humans, we our job is to remain skeptical. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there are multiple other questions, but I'm going to stop here. I don't want to test your patience because I would want you to come back at some later date. Hopefully, uh, when uh, there is a possible uh, that first cell cure very much inside, and I hope that it happens the soonest. And I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I have learned a lot. And uh, now I can uh, pretend to be quasi-educated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with this, thank you so much for doing it uh, on a busy day for you. And uh, I hope to, uh, I hope that we see you again. With this, thank you, uh, Adrapa. But I would now like to ask uh, Bilasha to conclude it. And I hope they have not been a wasted an hour and a half for you. Not at all. Uh, let me say thank you to all of you. And as I said, I'd like to recite something before I go to thank you. Um, but first, I must say that the person who invited me is missing from at least this uh, group that I see, uh, Mr. Najib Jung. Uh, please tell him that even though he was not here, I thank him for introducing me to such wonderful people. This has been an amazing experience. You guys were so well prepared and forget about all the preparation. The spontaneity of this conversation that evolved is something that I'm very deeply thankful for. The comments made by so many of you, positive comments, the questions that came have been wonderful. And so for me, Amok and Nita, the, this uh, one and a half hour is, I would say, very precious to me rather than considering it a waste of time. I think interacting with all of you has been wonderful. I'll end by reciting a poem which I grew up in the province of Sindh, Karachi. And in Sindhi, we have a very beautiful word, Sai. Sai can be applied to anyone. You know, Sai is, you can say, uh, Amok Sai, you can say Nita Sai, Sahiba, Sahab Sai, you know, but then you can call your beloved Sai. Even Allah is called Allah Sai in Sindhi. How beautiful is this word? You call your teacher Sai. 
So think of a word that applies to anyone from your beloved to Allah all the way in between. Teacher, revered figures, sign. And this poem that was written by a young physician working in my lab, Yasin Atir, is called Sai. Tumse agar na milta Sai, kaise vakt guzarta Sai? Tumse agar na milta Sai, kaise vakt guzarta Sai? Main hu ek musafir goya, tum ho mera rasta Sai. तुमसे अब क्या राज छुपाए मेरा राज तुम्हारा साईं सागर से अगर प्यार न होता दरिया उल्टा बहता साईं कागज पर दो चार लकीरें और न कुछ भी लिखा साईं हम और तुम एक साथ अकेले कमरा जब्त से महका साईं और मेरी बातें कान तुम्हारे बीच में एक सन्नाटा साईं मैंने पहरों सोचा साईं कोई तुमसे अच्छा साईं तुमको क्या बतलाए साईं कोई न तुमसे अच्छा साईं आदा बस <laughs> Uh, Abhilasha? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Arza, Azra. Um, I, I am completely lost of word and I'm so, I'm, 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 I can say this on behalf of every single individual over here today. Uh, with the beauty um, of poetry and the way you have explained us such criticality of this particular disease that we keep hearing now nowadays often in our day-to-day -day life so thank you so much it was it was a wonderful session and we feel so so um it was such a pleasure to have you us with uh, with all of us today so thank you so much so much ma'am on behalf of every single uh, person who has joined us today thank you so much ma'am <laughs>